Well, today we're going to be uh, finishing up 2 Corinthians, and Doug is out of town, and, and Pastor Jason uh, is doing a Sunday school class via Zoom or something with a uh, church in Oklahoma, so uh, they asked me if I would step in, and I tell you, I don't know if I like doing a lesson that Paul is talking about, so anyway, it's not, not easy, but... Uh, what we'll do is we'll start out by reading chapter 13 uh, one final time, and then we'll pray and then we'll consider the passage. So 2 Corinthians 13, starting with verse 1. This is the third time I'm coming to you. Every charge must be established by evidence of two or three eyewitnesses. I warned those who sinned before and all the others, and I warn them now while absent, as I did when present on my second visit that if I come again, I will not spare them. Since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test. But we pray to God that you may not do wrong, not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak, And you are strong, for your restoration is what we pray for. For this reason, I write these things while I am away from you, that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. Finally, brothers, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for, Lord, just your perfect word. Lord, just uh, the things that uh, you teach us through your word and the things that, Lord, we gain from your word, mostly uh, eternal life, Lord. Heavenly Father, I just lift your word up to you, and Lord, that uh, whatever comes out today as we consider these verses is, Lord, sent by you and not of man. In your name we pray, amen. Well, one thing that, I'm, I'm a pretty simple guy, those, those of you that know me, I, I, I think very simple thoughts, and sometimes we're going through, particularly like I said before, Paul or Corinthians, sometimes it's difficult to, to track what, exactly what Paul's saying, because I wouldn't say he's sarcastic, but he'll, he, he kind of, he goes back and forth with himself. It's like he argues with himself. You know, he says one thing and he says, no. Or he says something and he says, yes. And it's like, okay, so what's he really trying to say? So one thing I think is very important for us to look at uh, before we really finish up 2 Corinthians is just a quick, uh, kind of a quick timeline of all the things that have gone on with the Corinthians. Paul has spent a little more than 18 months with the Corinthians when he set up the church. So after he left uh, Corinth, uh, he received word of immorality in the church. So he sent sent a letter to them, since then that letter's been lost, uh, to confront that sin. He then received word that there were now divisions in the church itself. So false prophets and people were kind of changing others' minds. The Corinthians wrote Paul a letter asking for clarification of some of those issues. That was kind of the key. You know, they're sending him a letter saying, well, what about this? As opposed to just going by what he had told them when he was there for 18 months. So with that, Paul responded by writing 1 Corinthians. That's kind of what 1 Corinthians was, was a response to that letter they sent to him asking those questions. So then Paul sends Timothy to Corinth, and he receives more disturbing news Uh, of the difficulties, including the arrival of the false prophets. So Timothy goes, sends word back, 
Okay, not only do we have these other issues, we also now have false prophets. These false prophets attacked, attacked Paul's character to succeed in their own plans. So it wasn't that they were just teaching wrong theology. They were attacking Paul to tear down anything Paul had established. So Paul immediately goes to Corinth in what is known as his painful visit. You know, so we have, we have the lost letter, we have painful visit, we have a severe lever. So this kind of, kind of puts all that together for you. So uh, Paul did not consider his, his visit very successful because while he was there, they were openly insulting him and saying, you're not what you claim to be. So he's saddened by this, uh, by the Corinthians' lack of loyalty to defend him. So seeking to spare them further reproof and perhaps uh, hoping a little time would bring them to their senses, Paul returned back to Ephesus. From Ephesus, Paul wrote the severe letter, so where he's really reprimanding them, telling them, here's all the things that you're, that you're doing that is wrong. And he sent it with Titus back to Corinth. So Paul then went to Troas, and, and while he's there, he, he really, he's so anxious about the Corinthians, he can't even preach or teach. So he, he leaves to go look for Titus to find out, okay, how did they receive the letter? So Paul finally finds Titus, and to his relief and joy, Titus reports that most of the Corinthians had repented of their sin. So with that, Paul, being a wise man, he knows that if there's been a fire, there's still going to be some smoldering on the sides. Not, you know, and, and Titus had said, most of them have repented. So most of them may not be all of them. So that's when Paul says, I'm going to send a second letter. So he sends 2 Corinthians. And so as we've been studying the past several weeks, 2 Corinthians is primarily uh, defending his own apostleship. So that kind of brings us to where we are today. So last week, we got through the first part of verse 5, and Jerry very eloquently walked us through Paul's challenge uh, to the Corinthians to examine themselves and to test their faith. Specific areas that we can relate to were regeneration, and that was in 1 John 1, 5, and 6. The second was repentance, uh, 1 John 1, 8 through 9, and then sanctification. That's the three that we covered last week, and that was in 1 John 2, 4 through 6. So 1 John is really the book that gives you all the tests. So if you ever wonder about your faith... First John's the first place you ought to go, uh, and, and it's, a, it's an eye-opener, so I'm just going to say watch out. Uh, once again, like all true men of God, like all true pastors, Paul longed for his people to become mature in Christ. He wanted them to grow. He didn't want them just to be here and then just kind of bounce along with whatever little flavor of the month came along. Uh, so that's why in the preceding chapters, he discussed the importance of the repentance, he discussed the discipline, the discipline that it takes to be a true believer. And then also biblical authority, which is where we are with this chapter, really chapters 10 through 13, where Paul is more or less defending himself. The Corinthians had just really been led astray from the true gospel. And it's not much different than what we see today. Uh, we hear it just about every day, every week in, in the churches uh, the congregation will vote to do something which really takes that authority from the pastor. And why do they do that? So they can get more people. You know, we'll be more attractive to sinners if we're not quite so direct. Maybe if we soften the message a little bit, more people will come and respond. Is that what we really treat, truly need to be doing? Absolutely not. What we need to be doing is preaching the truth so that we can live by the truth, and so that we can have eternal life. But once again, the pastors and elders, are, are their authority is being taken away and given to congregations. They want more of a, uh, those of you in business, they want more of a horizontal organization as opposed to vertical. Now, what's the difference? Horizontal, everybody kind of has a little bit of say in it, whereas vertical is their one supreme authority. Ladies and gentlemen, church is not a democracy. Church is a monarchy. Our king, our leader, is Jesus Christ. 
period. And so this is a tragic mutiny of Scripture. Uh, once again, the church is not a, uh, a democracy. We as believers are subjects of the kingdom of God, the Father. And that, that's the piece that we sometimes forget. We think we're part of a congregation. We think we're part of Christians. We're part of the kingdom of God, the Father. And if you look at Mark twelve thirty four. And when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. So this person asked him a question, or he was asked a question, and he answered, and he answered correctly how anybody would answer or should answer if they were, if they were saved. But what does Jesus say? You're not far away. He wasn't there. So there's more to it than having the right answers. So, going on, uh, as it appears, many of the same issues happen in Paul's time as, as do today. And, and I know I think sometimes, gosh, if I'd have just been there to witness all this, man, it'd be so much easier. They had the same issues that we had. So those discussions that Paul was having makes the assumption when he's saying, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. He's making the assumption that those concerned are authentic Christians, okay? Because he, he had taught them, he had built the church, so he's given them the benefit of the doubt. Unfortunately, that's not the case in the church. Uh, in any congregation, there can and will be false brethren, and you have to watch out for that. So if you look at your, I believe I put it in your notes, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty six. Paul's giving a summation of his sufferings on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false believers. So let's look at Galatians 2.4. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy at our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they may bring us into slavery. Look at Matthew 15, 8. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And even all the way back into Isaiah, Isaiah 29, 13. And so the Lord says, these people say they are mine. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules Learned by rote. That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty stiff. Man-made rules learned by rote. Just basically repeating something doesn't make you a Christian. And then lastly, and I didn't put all the verses there, but, but uh, you'll understand it. The, the tares among the wheat, the, the parable of the tares among the wheat, found in Matthew 13, 25 through 30. You have the parable of the weeds, the man sowed the good seed, but his enemy came in and sowed weeds among them while he slept. So the one who sows the good seed, the son of man. The field is the world. Good seed are the sons of the kingdom. And weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them, the devil. So the point in going through those verses is to show there are be false believers that are there that are trying to sway us to move away from our true faith. Okay, they're trying to weaken it. They're trying to just tear little pieces apart as they can. As both Doug and Jerry have shared, Paul's desire for all believers is to live at the highest level of spiritual maturity. Therefore, Paul here, you know, he's, he's been on defense, defending himself. Here, Paul turns the table back on them to examine themselves and determine their true spiritual maturity. So picking up in 2 Corinthians 13, and, and the second part of verse 5 and 6, Paul states, Or do you not recognize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? But I trust that you will realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. So you have a lot of eyes and a lot of we's. What Paul is also pointing out is that if the fact if they did not pass the test, which he confidently believed they would, 
How would his apostleship be false? Or vice versa? How could, if Paul is there teaching them and leading them to the faith, how could they actually be saved if he was a false apostle? It's contradictory. So that's the point he's trying to make in that, in that second part. So if you look at uh, 1 Corinthians 4.15, For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So Paul is saying, I'm your spiritual father. Okay? So if he's a spiritual father, how could he be false if they were led to Christ? So that's his defense, and he's, put, he's turned the tables back on them. So now Paul moves on to continue his deepest longing for his spiritual children, that they lead godly lives. And, and that's where any little thing that came along disrupted the Corinthian church. They were, they were quick to believe. And if you remember back about the Corinthians, they were, they were the most debauched, for lack of a better term, uh, they were the worst of the worst in terms of lusts and sins. So it was very easy for them to be swayed because that was what they had always known. And now they've, they've made the turn towards Christ, so any little person that came in would disrupt that. So Paul, as their uh, spiritual father, is just he's, he's willing to appear to have failed as long as the Corinthians turned from their sin. So he's saying... In that, or that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test, I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test, but we pray to God that you may do no wrong, not that we may appear to have met the test, when we say we, he's talking about himself, but that you may do what is right, that we may seem to have failed. So he's saying, all I want you to do is do what's right. I want you to repent of your sin. And, and move towards Christ. And if that means you think I failed, so be it. But then he kind of comes back before and says, but I didn't fail because I'm the one that led you to Christ. So that's kind of what that point is. So looking at verse 7, but we pray to God that you may do no wrong, not that we may appear to have met that test, but that you, that you may do what is right, that we may seem to have failed. Paul is reemphasizing that he can't do anything against the truth but only for the truth. So Paul is, is, is giving even more evidence. And then he follows that. Let's look at uh, verse 9. For we can, or 8. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. So Paul is saying, Titus and I, or Timothy, or whomever was associated with the Corinthians, that they, are, they rejoice when the Corinthians repent and they do the right thing. They're not concerned about themselves uh, because their rest restoration is what Paul continued to pray for. And I, I, started, I actually started a list. I started putting all the scriptures down that, where Paul stated he was praying for different churches. I mean... I don't think that little copier back there would have handled it, but because it's numerous, all the things where Paul's saying, I pray that you, I pray that you, I pray that you. Paul is in constant prayer, just like we know Jason is for us. Jason is in prayer for us every day, just like Paul was. So he's refocused, uh, reemphasized that he can't do anything against them or against the truth, but only for the truth. And then in verse 9, he follows it up again with, For we are glad when we are weak, and you are strong. So Paul stating, uh, he will be glad if he returns and has to take no action. So if he has to return, or if he returns, and they've repented, and they're, they're headed the right direction, Paul's saying, I'm going to be happy in that. Because he didn't, he didn't want to have to take an action. He didn't want to use that uh, emphasis that he, he did have as an apostle. He wanted to find them a living, living according to the truth. In that case, he would rejoice in his weakness, their perceived weakness of him, you know, their perceived false apostle, because if they're living the truth, he, know he, did his, he knew he did his job. 
And so, uh, because that would mean that the Corinthians were spiritually strong. The Corinthians would be strong by being obedient. And for me, that's the key to all these verses, is obedience. And many times we read about being strong. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong. What does that really mean? To me, strong and obedient go together. Your strength is in your obedience. You know, your strength, I mean, it's in Christ, but it, through Christ, you're obedient. So if you look at uh, the verses that I put down, Paul wanted to be strong and obedient go together, and strong isn't intended to be a, a survivor or to survive or to persevere. It's to be both. So 1 Corinthians sixteen thirteen, Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Drop down to Ephesians six ten. Finally, be strong in the Lord and then the strength of His might. So if we're being strong in his, the strength of His might, that's not just being strong to persevere. We're being strong to do what is right, to be obedient. 2 Timothy 2.1 You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So Paul continuously warns his churches to be strong. He's warning each of us that temptation is real and Satan is always on the attack. We must stay strong in the faith through our obedience to Christ. So, drop down to verse 10. Paul, Paul gives us a one-verse summary of his purpose in writing this entire letter. For this reason, I write these things while I am away from you, that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. So he's gone through and reminded them of his... True apostleship, of testing themselves, of staying strong in the faith, and testing their faith. So he, he's gone through, gone through this entire book, and then he sums it up in one verse. So then in his final greetings, he drops down in, in verse 11. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. So in this final greeting, fighting the good fight of faith, Christians face three foes. And I've got those written down for you. The world. You guys think the world is a foe? Absolutely. The flesh. I'm not going to ask that question out loud. But I think we all would answer probably the same. And the devil. So if you look at the world, Christ chose us out of this world. We are not to, live, not to love the world. So some of the, uh, the supporting verses that I have, I, I did not write them out. I just, once again, trying to save paper. But John 15, 19. John 17, 14. 1 John 3, 13. Secondly, to fight that good faith, that good faith. The fight of good faith. Uh, the second foe is the flesh. Our unredeemed humanness. Abstain from fleshly lust, which we wa wage war against the soul. 1 Peter 2.11. And, and I sincerely hope that you will look, the, look at these verses just for that constant reminder. 1 Peter 2.11. Romans 7.8. Romans 8, 7 through 8, Galatians 5, 19 through 21, and 1 Corinthians 3, 1. Uh, there's, there's so much in God's Word about the flesh and avoiding those fleshly desires. And then manipulating all these things against our Heavenly Father is the devil. Uh, the devil was once exalt, exalted of all created beings. You can look that up in Ezekiel 28, 14. He was an angel among angels. He was one of the top dogs, so to speak. 
And he fell from that because of his own, his own desire to know more. He's now the evil one. He's a liar. John eight forty four. He disguises himself. Second Corinthians eleven fourteen, and Second Corinthians four four. He's the accuser, so he's constantly accusing us. Uh, reading McShane, um, we're been in Job. What did what did the devil do to Job? <laughs> it's because he has everything. Yeah, it it turned his back on you as soon as you took something away. So he's the accuser. He's the tempter. 1 Thessalonians 3, 5. And he's also, and I, this is to me was a key word, he's a hinderer. He hinders us. And that's 1 Thessalonians 2, 18. Like all believers, the Corinthian church was under siege from all three of these adversaries. So this, the devil, I mean, that basically, Corinth was his palace. It was nothing but sin. So Paul had come in and created a church and all these people had turned away from that sin. So Satan's on the attack in all three of the ways. The world, uh, the flesh, as well as manipulating and being the liar that he is. The world system was exceptionally vile. Uh, Once again, it was one of the most debauched cities in the ancient world. Paul actually used the phrase, be made complete. Uh, and, and my, my version uh, did not use that phrase, but it, in most of it, right after finally brothers rejoice, aim for restoration, be made complete. That be made complete, and I believe we've talked about this f- before, I believe Doug talked about it. It came from the Greek word uh, katartis, and katartis, uh, the verb form is katartizau. In that it, it didn't mean to add something which was lacking. So it's be made complete. So it's not, being, it's not saying bring in something else that's going to make you complete. What it means is to put things in the correct order. To adjust things that are out of adjustment. So things are going the way they should be going towards Christ. So once again, we're not looking for something else which is what the false accusers or the false apostles were doing. They were coming in saying, well, you need one more thing. Well, you need this. Well, you need that. And so to be made complete, that means put things in the right order, the things that were out of adjustment. So Paul is abhorring them to mend their ways, straighten themselves out, and restore that harmony that they had. So that's where he's going back and he's saying, Uh, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace. And if they do those things, and the God of love and peace will be with you. So that's what he's trying to trying to tell them. And I love how Paul ends this, the the Trinitarian Trinitarian benediction that he gives. And he quotes or he 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 talks about all three of the Trinity in, in that last verse, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So, grace came from Jesus Christ, the Son, love from God, the Father, and fellowship with God and other believers straight from the Holy Spirit. So, all three of the Trinity, Paul is saying, are going to add to us. So, Anyway, that's what I had for today. Uh, I I do have, if anybody wants, uh, I I can get it, bring it to you. If you would like to see kind of that historical uh, verse by verse of where the the history of the Corinthians came from, I can certainly give that to you. So just see me afterwards and I'll bring it to you next week. So anyway, anything anyone wants to add? get through a little bit early and have a little bit more blueberry coffee cake. All right, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for your word. Lord, we just uh, thank you for the reminder that it is and the directions that it gives, Lord, just in living a godly life and to, Lord, just uh, follow you in any way we can. Heavenly Father, uh, you are above all. 
You are perfect, you are sovereign, and you are our Father. Thank you for loving us, and we, Lord, we just thank you for our church. In the name we pray, amen.